Okay, so this is another question from the old worksheet. And I think I actually came up with this scenario. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I forget which questions I wrote and which questions I borrowed from my colleagues. Um, but I don't think uh, you have any homework question that looks like this. So for those of you interested in seeing additional scenarios, I think this can actually be a pretty good situation to consider. So, so let's consider, it says a small cube of some mass uh, slides down a circular ramp. Okay, uh, I'll cut into uh, as shown. Okay, so it looks like it's cut in such a way that when this M leaves the um, thing, it will be launched horizontally. I think that helps because um, dealing with the angles, like I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, so large block rests on the table and both the blocks move without friction. Yeah, so no friction here, uh, frictionless. The blocks are initially at rest and the cube starts from the top of the ramp. A, as the small cube leaves the large block, does the large block also move? I hope you have enough intuition to say yes, it moves. You, you can explain it in a couple different ways. You could explain it in terms of uh, Newton's third law. So you imagine this block um, sliding. There's no more force on it, pushing it that way, you know, perpendicular to the water, wherever it is. And there's a reaction force to that normal force that's going to be pushing the large block M. And so all these reaction forces are all kind of left toward the pointing for the ramp. So yeah, by the time this leaves, uh, there's going to be that amount of left toward the push that has pushed it to the left. Uh, that's one way to answer it. That answer I think you could have given um, like uh, two, three weeks ago. The answer you can give this week is from conservation of momentum. Because you can consider two snapshots. This snapshot here, let me call that snapshot zero. <laughs> Sorry, I gotta start thinking about how I label these subscripts. And imagine this snapshot one. So in snapshot zero, it's quite clear that the net momentum, the total momentum is zero. You know, nothing's moving anywhere. In this snapshot one, you have this situation where, well, one of the pieces is moving to the right. You have MV1. And whatever you get with the ramp, you know, well, if you have this intuition that you think momentum will be conserved in this setup, and we'll verify that in a bit, then this ought to be zero. And so if momentum is going to be conserved here, you must have something like a minus big M V. Uh, I really should think through uh, one M <laughs> this subscribe. Uh, yeah, one M. Um, so, so, it, so this needs to be something like that for the momentum to be conserved, which means the ramp must be moving to the left. So, so yeah, the large block must also move. You can explain it either based on a Newton's third law or based on conservation of momentum if you have a feeling that momentum might be conserved in this setup. So maybe uh, let me label this uh, snapshot uh, properly so that uh, I don't get into trouble. Uh, let me label them A and B. Yeah, and uh, this will be V1B uh, and this will be V2B or something. Okay, so is mechanical energy conserved in this process? Oh, yeah, so um, this is the place where I would uh, uh, have you um, get practice using these uh, conditions. So for energy to be conserved, when, again, this is the most succinct statement I can make, every word here matters, when no non-conservative force does net work. So the only non-conservative force to worry about here is normal force because um, the gravity is conservative. The question already said no friction. So it's, uh, here is the question of uh, does normal force do work? And it's uh, actually a little bit tricky because I think uh, normal force here does the work. But the kind of work the normal force does, it just ends up transferring energy from small mass m to big mass m. It's not the kind of uh, uh, work that uh, kind of reduces the total mechanical energy. So, um, so 
based on that intuition, I will say uh, that energy is conserved. Yes. And to the question, does normal force to work? Uh, only in a way that transfers energy within the system. So energy is conserved. For C, is momentum conserved? I have a similar, very succinct statement about when momentum is conserved. Again, every word here matters. Uh, momentum is conserved when no external force impart net impulse. So here the external forces that you would worry about would be, um, so normal forces uh, internal, so you wouldn't worry about them. Uh, there is normal force from this surface that would be external, so that you might worry about. Um, and there's gravity. So you got uh, normal force from table and you got gravity. Um, well, gravity uh, on M and, uh, small m and big m. And it's the question of do they impart net impulse? And you might say yes. And, and you can kind of see, you know, this small mass m is uh, dropping down. So, of course, it's uh, getting impulse. Um, and I think I can kind of answer in a two different way. Um, so if you observe the fact that this block is being launched horizontally, so you start it out with nothing uh, moving vertically, and in the end, uh, in snapshot B, nothing still moving vertically, then you could say from A to B, the total um, integrated impulse due to normal force and gravity together, they somehow add up to zero. That would be one way to answer it. Maybe a little bit overcomplicated, but one. Um, here's a simpler way you can address it, um, where you can notice that both the normal force from the table and gravity are vertical forces. And momentum, it's a vector quantity. So whenever we talk about momentum conservation, we are really talking about uh, two or three different uh, conservations. We are talking about is uh, x component of momentum conserved, is y component of momentum conserved, if it's three-dimensional, is z component of momentum conserved. And we can answer each one individually, independently from the other. So uh, let's just deal with the two dimensions in the plane of the drawing. So we could say if we are defining our axis this way, x and y, the normal way, <laughs> then we could say y momentum, you know, I don't know. It might not be conserved because of these external forces. But I can still say my x component of momentum is still conserved because there's no external force in the x direction that could possibly change momentum. So, so let me stick with that and I'll say momentum is conserved yes for x direction that i know for sure without having to worry about you know exact like what's happening in snapshot b as opposed to the moment before so that's the answer to c uh, so momentum is conserved for the x direction at least and i think that'll be enough Part D, it has to find the speed V of the small cube as it leaves the large block. So here's the upshot of um, having said that energy and momentum are conserved, both of them conserved together um, through from snapshot A to B. The upshot of that is I can just uh, use conservation of energy and momentum from A to B just in one shot. No need to break things down. I can just do the whole thing in one shot. So let me just get a copy of this below and we will write out the conservation of um, energy and momentum equations for part D. So looking at this snapshot, I will say, so I'm applying conservation law strategy. And I think based on our earlier discussion, I think that energy is conserved and the X component of momentum conserved. So let me start with energy. I'm gonna say, my total energy in snapshot A is equal to my total energy in snapshot B, which means, um, so let me write out all the terms that could have possibly be involved. Um, in snapshot A, I think it's clear there's no kinetic energy. So I will say 
potential energy of the small mass m or uh, let me use a uh, number one for the small mass and number two for the big mass so potential energy of 1a plus potential energy of 2a is equal to snapshot b um, so to write out everything it would be a potential energy of 1b plus potential energy of 2b plus kinetic energy of uh, 1b plus <laughs> kinetic energy of 2b. Uh, let me make this uh, a little bit simpler for myself. I noticed that m does not move in the vertical direction ever. So I could say my m, uh, whatever its potential energy is in snapshot b and snapshot a, they're equal to each other. So I'm just going to cancel them out. Because it's not changing. It's like they are on both sides, equal, cancel them out. For potential energy of the object 1, if I do this, say that this is my y equal to 0, that makes things a little bit easier. I can say by convention, potential energy 1b is 0. And I only have to worry about writing the expression for this with this reference point. And I think actually that's going to be easy because isn't that height just R? So I think it's going to be pretty easy. So let me write down that final last expression. So uh, potential energy 1A, that's going to be at height of R. So it'll be MGR, that's that potential energy. That's equal to, let's write down, um, yeah, now I have to write out the kinetic energies in terms of their speeds. So it'll be one half m, um, yeah, small mass m, uh, yeah, and I don't have to subscribe it because it doesn't change. One half m times uh, v one b squared plus kinetic energy of the larger block one half a big m times v two b squared. So as you look at it here, um, I hope you notice that you have two unknowns, v one b and v two b. And that is really why we need the second conservation law strategy. Because um, I have one equation, two unknowns, it's not solvable. But this is where momentum conservation will hopefully give me enough information where I can solve it. So with the momentum, so I'm going to um, just do the same thing I was doing with the energy. I start out with the statement of conservation, my total momentum in snapshot A is equal to my total momentum in snapshot B. Oh, and it becomes easier by the fact that initially nothing's moving, so initial momentum is zero. So my final momentum must also be zero. Let me write down the expressions for it. So I anticipate small mass m is moving to the right, so I'll say plus small mass m v1b, and I anticipate the larger ramp big M is moving to left. And let me uh, encode that direction into my equation. I'm going to say minus big M V2B. And if I'm somehow wrong and this ramp is moving to right instead, then I'll get a negative number for this. So, so, so yeah, this is my equation two. And I think uh, I didn't introduce any new unknowns. So I have two equations, two unknowns, out to be solvable. I think I'm a little bit over time, but let me just uh, uh, solve it. Uh, I think, uh, what are they asking for? Are they asking for both the speeds? Ah, speed of the small cube as it leaves the large block. So let's just pretend for the time being that we are interested in this and this alone. And what that means is the things that I'm going to solve for right now, I should be solving for um, things other than V1B. So let me uh, do that algebra here. Because uh, whatever I'm solving for right now, my goal for solving for them is to eliminate it. So I'm going to solve for V to be here and use that solved expression to eliminate it from my equation one. So from equation two, solving for V to be, V to be is equal to, I'm just going to do the algebra in my head. Double check me, please. <laughs> it's going to be equal to small m over big m times V one B. So I'm going to plug this into equation one to eliminate that V to B and get this one equation 
MGR is equal to 1 half M V1 B squared plus 1 half of B gam. And now that expression, small m squared over B gam squared times V1 B squared. So this is my now one equation. Let me call that 1 B uh, in terms of one unknown V1 B. So, um, so looking at it, I, it looks like I need to do a little bit of factoring on the right hand side. So let me do that. I'm going to factor out V1B squared, V1B squared. And the remaining fact, the, the expressions are 1 half small m plus, and let me simplify this as I write it out. 1 half, a uh, one factor of this big m will cancel out with that factor. And let me just pull out one factor of small m here. So I get um, small m times small m over big M. And V1 B squared was already factored out. I'm doing it that way because I'm noticing that I can factor out these additional factors. So um, I can factor out one half a small m. So one half small m V1 B squared times one plus the, those ratio of masses small m over big M uh, is equal to MGR. The, they wanted us to solve for the speed. Let's do that. Um, oh, I think a small m cancels out. Uh, one factor of it anyway. It still remains here. Um, so solving for V1B in my head. Again, double check my algebra, please. Sometimes I do make mistakes when I do algebra in my head. <laughs> um, V1B is equal to square root of 2GR over that thing divide, you know, 1 plus the ratio of the masses. Yeah, so that's the answer. And uh, kind of the difference between when the big M moves and when it doesn't move it amounts to this uh, factor here. Because you can imagine, you know, in the limit, the big mass M is infinitely big, so it would never move. Then this uh, uh, term becomes one. So yeah, that's the motion, the speed that you would have expected from conservation of energy alone with a small m, you know, square root of 2g times the height. And uh, when this uh, big block moves, it uh, launches at a slightly slower speed. And that slower speed accounts for the energy that's imparted to the um, imparted to the uh, to the uh, big mass m, so that's what part is getting in. You know what fraction of initial energy goes into, and so on. Is that um, I think when you do all that tracking, you'll find that yeah, they are consistent, and um, the in the limit where um, in the limit where big mass m is much larger than the small mass m. V1B does become the quantity that we would expect, a square root of 2GR. Uh, that's also consistent with what we would expect.